All right. Well, in this segment, I'm talking with a new addition to our monthly property management update. And I'm talking with David Weiss with Rivendale Real Estate. David, glad to have you here. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. So a lot of our listeners don't are not familiar with you and Rivendale. So tell us about you and your property management company. Uh, yeah, so uh, we've been in business, uh, the property management division, for about six years. Uh, we currently manage about 230 doors. Uh, that's a mix of apartments, um, duplexes, single-family homes. Uh, we About 30% of our portfolio is Section 8, or lower-income housing. And uh, we are all over Denver Metro, as far north as Thornton, as far south as Castle Rock. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we don't discriminate. We, we have a little bit of everything in our portfolio. Great. Well, this will be a good sample size to see see how uh, the tenants are or are not paying. So we are recording this on June 8th. So Monday, June 8th, we're recording this so everyone knows. So let's jump back and look at May. Uh, how did rents pan out for you in May? Um, so in May, we, overall, Chris, I, we have not experienced much of a difference. Um, when I found out that I was going to be talking to you, I kind of looked back at our numbers and I thought it would be interesting uh, to compare 2019 to 2020 and also uh, kind of look at it month over month. And um, so for May of 2020, uh, we were at 96% rent collection, uh, about 484,000 and change. Um, so, um, and that's, that is kind of where we were last year also. If you look at 2019, we were actually a little bit less, 93% rent collection. Uh, obviously a lower number, but we had fewer doors at that time. Yeah, but actually percentage-wise, you ended up collecting more rents this May than in May 2019. Slightly more this May than last May, yep. Wow. Yeah. Um, and how is June stacking up so far? Our listeners know that, you know, late fees aren't being collected right now, all that, but just how's it looking so far from rents collected, tenants talking to you? What's the pulse for June? Uh, June is, it looks to be on track, and I think we're going to be right in that same number, 95% of rent collection. Uh, obviously, it doesn't look that way right at this moment, but um, we use the first 10 days of the month to um, collect rents, talk to tenants, reconcile books, uh, get payments ready for owners, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're not quite through our process yet for me to give you a, a, a hard, fast number, but uh, so far looks to be on track. Okay. And I want to, because I know you said about 30% uh, of your portfolio is with Section 8. And, right. you know, I, I'm a big fan of Section 8. A lot of my investors, you know, uh, love Section 8 tenants because of the guaranteed government money. Now, for the other two-thirds of your portfolio, what type of tenant class or property class does your portfolio have? Um, I would say for most of our single-family homes, uh, we're kind of in that um, $2,000 a month range. We do have some outliers that are, are more uh, on the higher end of the spectrum, 2,500 to 3,500, but that's a pretty small uh, percentage of our portfolio. The majority of our single-family homes um, are in that uh, 1800, 1900 to kind of 23, 2400 range. Okay. And then um, I would say as far as the, the townhouses, a little bit less, but um, all, everything's kind of in that, I, I would say, mid-level range, so to speak. And so far with, you know, all the properties you manage and the tenants you're talking to, are you noticing like certain segments of the market or certain property types, you know, being hit harder than other types of your portfolio? I mean, it's funny. I mean, my experience with this, uh, and this has happened, I, I've been watching the numbers since this started in, in March. Um, and it's been consistent throughout is that the, the people that typically pay rent have continued to pay rent and the people, uh, the residents that we, we kind of consistently struggle with um, seems to be the ones that are continuing to struggle and, and have one more reason to not not pay on time. Okay. Um, and and I don't know that there's one uh, one class of property or one significant area uh, that has has shown more delinquency than another. It just it's it's more behavioral on a case by case basis. 
And do you have any tenants that are just taking advantage of the eviction moratorium and they're saying, hey, you can't kick me out, screw you, don't return your phone calls, don't pay? Um, I, I have not had anyone say that directly. We, we certainly have a list of uh, demand for compliance tenants, uh, demand for rent tenants, where we've sent out the notices, um, even though we really can't follow through with the eviction process at this point, we at least want to get the ball rolling, um, have our ducks in a row for when things open back up to be able to follow through with those. But, but no one has reached out specifically and said, we're aware of the situation and we're going to take advantage of that and not, not move out. It's, it, uh, again, it's been it's, it's the tenants that struggled long before COVID-19 are continuing to struggle and, 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 uh, and the, the pandemic, so to speak, has not, not had a, a large effect on that. Okay. And so have you had anyone that just not paid any rent since, what, April when that moratorium came out? Uh, no, no, okay. we haven't had it, nothing like that. That's great news. So what other, like, so those are the stats I wanted to cover with you, but what other trends are you seeing or that, no, that are newsworthy to talk about to other investors here in Denver? Um, I, in my opinion, the news so far has been good. Um, for example, it's leasing season, as you know, most of our, most of our leases uh, turn around sometime in the time between May, June, and July. Uh, so we're right in the heart of that. Um, and what we've seen is we've seen an increase in renewals. So uh, less people moving, more people wanting to stay put, which I think makes sense given the current um, environment with, the, with COVID-19. Um, but on the properties that are vacant. Let me, sorry, let me, uh, I'm ask, let me ask you a question before you move on yeah, there, sure. uh, David. Are you, for those renewals, are you bumping up the rents like you normally would in previous years or are you keeping things flat? What are you doing on the renewals? So great question. So when we started renewals early on, uh, I think that there was a, a concern because of COVID that there were going to be non-payments of rent and that it would be, um, it would not be a good idea to raise rents. Um, and so that's what we were telling landlords. We were saying, hey, here is the market analysis our recommendation is not to raise rents. And, and I, we work with some investors who own um, you know, up to 20 properties, and some of them were adamant about trying to raise rents. And surprisingly, what we saw is that the, the, the raise in rents um, did not come back to bite us and that most residents uh, still renewed. And so because of that, uh, recently with renewals, we've been raising rents uh, anywhere from two to 4% on average, and and we're not seeing um, we're not seeing any uh, res negative response from those rent increases. And uh, on the properties that are vacant, we're we're we are getting lots of demand. And our average days of vacancy is uh, ten to fourteen days, and that includes the days it takes to turn the property. And so that's I mean ten to fourteen days. That sounds about in line with what it was previous or uh, pre COVID, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, I, I think, and, and that, I mean, the only difference is we had a few properties that we, um, you know, we couldn't show while occupied. And even those properties, um, you know, we're getting them turned in 10 to 14 days. And that includes uh, getting the property rent ready, showing it and getting a new lease signed, which is really remarkable. And so you're not having any problems getting um, your contractors in there to do the work? or any issues like that as far as like maintenance or turning units, any delays there from COVID? No, nothing, nothing. Okay. So what about, um, I noticed we talked about leasing here. Um, let me see here. Are you seeing, cause I know you manage, you guys manage some multifamilies as well. Are you seeing less interest in multifamilies and more interest in single family homes? You know, cause we've all read these articles about people wanting to, you know, have their space and migrate out to single family homes. Are you noticing any of those trends yet? So I, certainly the demand for single family homes seems higher than the multifamily. Most of our multifamily is, is uh, more B, C level properties that do accept Section 8 vouchers. Uh, across the board, we've seen less demand for Section 8, which is not usually the case, but that's what we've seen recently. Um, so yeah, a little bit less demand for multifamily, um, 
I, I can't speak for the high level, uh, you know, A plus or A properties and multifamily sector, but but in the lower stuff, we're seeing a little less demand, but still overall still very good, still easy to get things rented in a very reasonable amount of time. Okay. Now, you know, a lot of the people listening to this show are investors and other, you know, professionals around the industry that invest themselves or help investors. What's your advice to investors out there? And they've got, you know, a fifth, you know, they get their 50, 100, $200,000 in cash earmarked for real estate investing. Is this a great time, a bad time? Um, or what comments do you have to investors out there looking to buy more rental properties? Um, a good question. So my, my experience as an investor, so I, I own properties as well as manage properties in Denver. And, and what I've come to learn is I feel like there is opportunity regardless of the market condition. The market may dictate what a opportunity looks like, but there's opportunities to be had regardless. And if you do your research and you do the homework, you can find deals regardless of market condition. I think some of the things to look at are competitive advantage you know, do you know the neighborhood? Um, do you know a contractor who can who can do uh, make ready work for a discount? Um, all those things uh, matter greatly more so, I think, than the actual market condition. And then the other thing I think is that due to due to the current condition, um, rent freeze, mortgage freeze, the in, uh, uh, influx of government money via stimulus and unemployment is I is I think. Um, that we may have not seen the effects of, of to the economy and on real estate specifically that COVID is going to have as of yet because it's being delayed by this by this additional money coming into the marketplace. And so I think um, even though the real estate market can always be defined as unpredictable, I think even more so now uh, it's especially unpredictable uh, because of those reasons. And I would I would be cautious. Um, I think a lot of people are excited about low interest rates and, and the idea of getting involved in the market and, and picking up properties at a discount because of this. And I've almost seen people move prematurely um, into something that they think is a good deal, but may not be a good deal in the next six to 12 months. So uh, from like a 30,000 foot level, you know, it's from like a, a long-term perspective for, you know, buy and hold investors. If I'm understanding correctly, it sounds like no major red flags to say stop investing, just really do some extra due diligence? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think okay. due diligence is a must in any marketplace. Um, yes. I, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's, there's going to be good deals and bad deals out there in any, in any market condition. Um, and the seasoned investors are the ones that know how to sift through that and find the right deals. And so I've been, I've always been a proponent of, uh, you know, uh, opening up property to Section 8 tenants because I, you know, you get some great government money there. And when COVID first hit, I became a lot more interested in saying, hey, I, want, I wish all my tenants were Section 8 because I thought that, you know, the world may fall off a cliff there. Do you think it's more prudent now to focus more on Section 8 tenants or government uh, voucher tenants? Or are you not seeing a difference in um, enough difference to say, hey, only go Section 8 or stick with Section 8 and market? Um, so I... I like you, I am pro Section 8. I think it's a good program. I think it's good in, for investors, but I think it's important that you understand it. A lot of times I talk to investors and they think that because a resident has a, a Section 8 voucher, that that means that the entire amount of rent is guaranteed. And that is not always the case. There, yep. Oftentimes if they're employed, uh, a, a, a significant percentage of the rent they're still re responsible for. Um, that being said, they are just as likely or unlikely to not be able to pay that rent due to whatever circumstances are going on in their life. So I think Section 8 is great. Um, a lot of times we are able to procure a higher than market rent rate for a property if we allow Section 8, which is advantageous to our clients. Um, but I, I also think that there's some truth that, that um, Section 8 comes with its own its own set of factors that, that can be considered additional risk. Uh, another thing to keep in mind is that due to COVID and remote working spaces, most of the housing agencies that we partner with that work with uh, Section 8, um, typically they don't work really fast as it is. And, and now because of the remote working conditions, uh, the, the initial payment from Section 8 is even slower um, sometimes exceeding 60 days. So if you're a landlord and you don't have a reserve, 
and you put in a Section 8 tenant, um, you need to be prepared to, to float your mortgage payment uh, for 60 days plus before you get that first rent check. And I think a lot of uh, landlords um, don't realize that and are unprepared for that. Yeah, I, I got a unit leased up right at the April 1, leased up a week week or two before right as the pandemic hit, uh, you know, through a Section 8 program. And I'm still waiting on the, the first month and the second month, I guess now the third month's worth of rent too, just because they're taking a lot longer. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. Yeah, they take longer and there's a lot of, as you know, there's a lot of paperwork that you got to fill out. And if you, yeah. if you miss one date or one signature or you don't do that right, it can delay the process. And it's, um, it, it's certainly more work on the front end with the Section 8 tenant uh, than a, a traditional tenant. Well, David, this has been uh, great. As we wrap up, any final data points or thoughts that you want to share before we end the call? Um. I don't think so. That, that pretty much covers my list. Great. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time today to uh, come in here, spend 20 minutes with me and the listeners out here to share this information. And I'll put all your contact details and your guys' website in the show notes so people can reach out to you. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thanks, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.